Hey, hey everybody, I'm Z Garcia. Welcome back to Board Game Blender. Today, we are going to be taking a look back at 2018. We're going to be highlighting some uh, awesome games that came out in the year. Just discussing a couple of things as far as gaming goes overall. For me personally, I thought it was a fantastic year in gaming. I noticed a few trends that I was very happy continue. Things like, you know, having lots of solitaire uh, games available. The quality and artwork in smaller productions match some of those in uh, from very big publishers. I love seeing that, seeing that level playing field where you can get a, a stunning looking, very good game from a company that has one or two games out, or maybe it's even their first published uh, design. So I saw that, uh, lots of roll and write still, smaller games, lots of family style games, thematic ideas coming together with mechanical concepts that are solid and giving us really great games that are both, you know, engaging thematically, but also really interesting to play. So lots of cool things. Um, the main thing I want to hear from you, just because I enjoy the sort of thing, tell me in the comments below the one game from 2018 that does not seem to be getting as much buzz or attention as you think it should. I'm curious to hear what you've got to say about that. But other than that, let's go ahead and kick off the show. We're back. back! Howdy folks, welcome to the two-player showdown. I'm Hunter, this is Rebecca, and we're here to talk about our amazing experiences of 2018. 2018 was crazy over the top awesome. Let's get it right started right here, right now with... One of my most memorable experiences this year was the Dice Tower Convention, and it was a wonderful experience. I went with my two girls, Hunter had to work, we got to play lots of games, see new faces and old faces, and we got to go and uh, announce the Dice Tower Awards, and just, it was a wonderful, all-around good time, very comfortable, my favorite convention, Dice Tower Con. Well, I didn't get to go to the Dice Tower Con. I got to go, along with a bunch of my friends and family, got to go to a board game retreat that we organized in a lodge up in the middle of nowhere. We had a group of friends get together. We played all kinds of games, ate crazy amounts of food, three crazy nights, four awesome days. I even got to paddle a rowboat around the lake. It has nothing to do with gaming, but it was fun. <laughs> that was a good one, yes. And then... We also had a great experience at BGG Spring. It's one of our conventions that we always take the girls to. It's local for us. We got to play a bunch of games, see a bunch of familiar con friends again, play all the games. We even had a little mini meetup for our family showdown group. Marvelous time, wonderful people, fantastic games. The whole works. Yeah, I got to spend Friday morning while Rebecca was working with the girls and we played all kinds of kids games. It was awesome. Yeah. Next up, last but not least, because we have lots of honorable mentions that we're going to rattle off really quickly, but last but not least, the Dice Tower Retreat. We had the honor and privilege of attending the Dice Tower Retreat. It was awesome. We got to play games with pretty much almost everyone that was there. A bunch of Dice Tower folks. It was a great experience, a great time. A bunch of wonderful people playing lots of wonderful games. That was a lot of fun. I like the fact that it was a low count and we had all this, the great library, just a lot of fun faces get to play all the games, no schedule. Super awesome. So 2018 was jam packed full of great, great, great gaming. We mentioned four things. There's several others I want to mention quickly. We got to go to PAX Unplugged. Well, at least I got to go to PAX Unplugged. We did a couple local conventions that was awesome. We love the small conventions. We got to game with our family, family that we haven't seen in a long time over Christmas. We got to do a BGG cruise, which was amazing. It was our first cruise. We didn't do much gaming. That's why we didn't mention it. We were mostly doing cruise stuff. <laughs> 2018 was awesome. And 2019 promises to be an even more exciting and better year gaming with all of you wonderful people. We are going to be starting it off with the Dice ah. Tower. Save that for next episode. See you next time. Hi everybody, it's Stephanie here. 
2018 was such an exciting and fun year for me, but a few games and moments really stood out to me over the year, and that is what I'm going to show you today. I started off the year attending the Fireball Island party here in the Seattle area. My daughter and I made a cake for the party and I got to meet so many amazing Fireball Island fans and some great people from Restoration Games too. We made a video to go along with it which is always fun. I also made a cake for one of my favorite games of 2018 and that was The Grim Forest. For me, The Grim Forest hands down has the best art and components and was overall the best experience I had in creating content. This cake video went viral on Facebook so that was pretty exciting for me too. We didn't attend very many conventions this year, but we did go to PAX West here in Seattle where we played some games, some that we already had and some were new to us too. We always have the best time at PAX. Our favorite game of 2018 is My Little Scythe. This game has an adorable theme where you collect apples, build friendships, and have pie fights. We also made a cake to match it too, which is always super fun for us. My favorite episode of Board Game Blender from 2018 was titled Magic Hour. If you haven't seen that one, go back and watch it because we all had so much fun doing magic tricks and it gave me the chance to make a cake inspired by the game Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. I really love that game. I hope you had a fantastic 2018 too. Thank you so much for leaving us those nice comments and watching our videos throughout the year. All right, I'll see you guys later. Bye. For my game Under the Radar, there were many choices I could have made, actually. There were lots of good games that probably flew under the radar, but looked like heavy hitters that were engaging, fun, gorgeously illustrated. This is certainly one of them, so I chose to go with Small Islands here. Small Islands, as you can see, is very bright and colorful. The production quality is, is stunning. It's a very well put together package. But it is from a small company, Mushroom Games that I had not heard of before. I, this might even be their first game. Uh, the game is a tile laying game in which you are going to be building islands of these tiles. So you have lots of these different tiles here. You are going to be taking them from the board, building an island, and then deploying your little huts to the islands, scoring different things. That kind of sounds like Carcassonne, but the game differs from that concept enough that I would say it's its own creation. It really is different. You're gonna have a secret goal every round. It tells you what kind of uh, prerequisites are necessary at an island to be scored by you. And then it tells you what you actually score on that island. So let's say on this island I need a temple and I need uh, two dragon fruit symbols. If an island has that, when it's time to score, then you can deploy a temple to that island, uh, one of your little huts that is, and then you will score for those, you know, whatever it says. Oh, you get one point per temple, one point per dragon fruit. Okay, great. And you're going to gather victory points. And then the next round, you are dealt some more goal cards. You'll pick one of those and continue. There's a couple of twists, though. Once you've scored an island and left your little hut behind, you can go back to that island. And the places where the huts can go are limited. You cannot just go on any old spot you want. You have to go somewhere that has the outline to hold one of the huts. So if you're playing with more players, that could be a problem. I, I like the game quite a bit with two players, though. It's really fun. Now, the, the fight for the locations isn't as um, important in that one. But it's still an engaging concept. And like I said, the game just looks fantastic. Card quality is great. Tiles are very well laid out, bright, attractive. The board develops in a, in a beautiful, soothing manner. All the tokens are great. Lots of content for it being, like I said, a fairly small production, but with gorgeous production values. It's even got a solitaire mode in here that you can play, so there's uh, just a little bit for everyone in this box. I really was impressed uh, with small islands. I would certainly recommend it to anyone looking for a fun, somewhat original, but also pleasantly familiar concept when it comes to family weight games. Small Islands, very nice stuff, a great game from 2018, and unfortunately one that I, I fear will be flying under the radar just because of the, uh, you know, how, how available it might be or just the, the company not being able to push the game particularly much. So, 
If you do spot it, if it sounds good, you can go check out a review I did of the game as well if you want to know a little bit more about it. But I would certainly recommend that you give it a go. So there you go. That is Small Islands for my Under the Radar. Hello, friends of the blend, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Today we're talking about highlights of 2018. So I want to take this opportunity to revisit some of my more memorable segments the past year. Starting with my dislike for Monopoly. Now, every time that I've ever played Monopoly in my life, I've never ever finished the game before because it just gets so tedious and boring. So every chance that I get in a segment, I like to try to destroy Monopoly in some fashion. So back in episode 87, when I showcased Raiders of the Lost Ark, I was in a jungle and I squished Monopoly with a rock. In episode 88, Monopoly Jr. took its revenge when I was showcasing aliens and it was a chest burster that came out of my chest. In episode 90, uh, with the help of Mark Maya from Board Game Coffee, I was having a nightmare where every single one of my games turned into Monopoly. My most longest and most funniest film shoot has to go to episode 76 when I showcased Dynamite Shack. I had both my parents on and I remember that that filming took about two and a half to three hours because my mother would mess up, I would mess up, my father would mess up even though he had no lines all he had to do was look straight ahead and even the, the uh, shack would sometimes malfunction but uh, the video shoot went on and on and my father was getting annoyed so the reaction that you see on his face was him really getting upset. Whenever I put the call out to my mother to help me with one of my video shoots, she really gets excited because she really enjoys doing it. I remember two video shoots where it was really fun working with her. Episode 84, High Gear, we made her run across different terrains um, in probably about 100 degree weather. So she wasn't too thrilled about that, but she was a trooper and she did it anyway. And in episode 91, when I showcased Key to the Kingdom, she actually turned into me, so I had to do voiceover work with her. So everything that she had to say had to be exactly the same thing that I said. So that was a real fun shoot also. And finally, my best game of 2018 has to go to Codename Sector. It's an electronic game where you're trying to find a hidden sub before your opponents do. And it's just a really challenging game, even for that time. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet with me at RetroBoardGamer. And I hope to see you in 2019. And as always, may your rolls be high. Welcome to Bickering Over Board Games, where we talk about topics, trends, and things in board gaming and how we feel about them. So the topic for the blender this week is basically 2018 a retrospective in gaming and the trend that I was thinking that we should talk about this week is um, us yeah <laughs> well specifically what I think is a trend increase of media about board games whether it be YouTube videos podcasts um, and then also just I mean we've talked about salt con in the past but mm -hmm. I have to say that is a highlight for 2018 as it was 17 and 16 and you went twice this year uh, I did because this year for the first time ever they had a salt con in the summer and just the community that we've gotten out of salt con that's where we I was went to go. Um, a northern Utah gamers guild it technically wasn't in 2018 but it was celebrating the holiday season of 2018 which i think is traditionally the, you know that caps off the yeah year, yeah right? when you do a game exchange with a yeah so all we, year it's friends. A, well it's very stressful wits and wagers to see who gets to go first and we're not trivia people so how it works is you bring a board game you wrap it up like a present you put it on a table and then it's there's a series of games it's it was really fun it was a good night Play Dino Island, still too short. We need to actually sit down and play a long game of that because I always, my strategy's too far, it's too far it's focused. Fi it's finally starting to click for me. Yeah, right? my biggest is we're talking about this trend is this game is broken. I can't listen to any other board game podcast, but that and just makes me LOL. 
And we got into that in 2018. I started listening to more podcasts, including uh, Board Games in Bed, which mm -hmm. I really enjoy. I started listening to the Shut Up and Sit Down podcast. And I just want to say that when I started in the hobby of board games, as far as I was aware, and I could have been wrong, but the, uh, the best, most consistent video, like, you know, YouTube board game reviews mm -hmm. that were out there was the Dice Tower. I mean, there was no Shut Up and Sit Down. There was no Man vs. Meatball. There was no uh, uh, Dan King. What's his show called? The Game, the game Boy Geek? I don't even know why I'm on this geek. show. I have no um, idea what he's talking about. <laughs> the point is, is that we have gone from... We as a community have gone from having... I mean, really, like, it used to be hard to get reviews sometimes of games that were out. And now... If anything, there's almost too much, but you can't have too much of a good thing. Good thing. I also want to give a plug to Actual. Like, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's like Actual. -l -l -l. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. great. He's great. Episode. No pun included is a really good. I mean, there's just so much content. I'm sure there's a bunch of other stuff that I have that I watch that I'm not yeah. thinking about right now. See, that's and why you have to be like me. You just pick one thing and you get stubborn that that's the only thing that you like. Well, you know Dan has a new uh, podcast, right? I'd probably like that. Yeah. So, um, we also have a YouTube channel that we have been neglecting, but we are going to start putting out content again like we used to. I can think of one highlight from 2018 that we haven't talked about. Is it being on the board game blender? Yes. I mean, technically, we started in the fall of 2017. But who's counting it's an that? an opportunity oh. that I've loved. Yeah, it's been really cool and weird. I mean, the other day, because my dad was in a couple episodes ago, he was going into church, and this kid comes up and says, I didn't know you were into board games. And my dad's like, oh, yeah, well, my son-in-law, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I saw you on the board game it's blender. It's such a small world. And well, that's incredible. This kid had no idea... He was we watching were. the blender. And In now fact, we're talking like, about you. What is his name? I don't remember. He's probably not even a kid. He's probably like a... He's probably... He's probably an adult, but your father <laughs> refers to anybody under 50 as a kid. Yeah. Um, so that was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. It's The comments have been wonderful. Thank you guys for all the support. And for calling us out. And when necessary. Yeah. Um, friends hold friends accountable. It's true. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, happy new year. year. Happy new year. Yeah. For my quirky game of 2018, I wanted to highlight Keyforge here. Now, Keyforge is uh, what they're calling a unique game system, Fantasy Flight Games. And I kind of say that in quotes a little bit. This is sort of a collectible card game 2.0, which is interesting because this is now the second time that FFG rewrites the collectible card game concept. They have collectible card games out there, but they came out with the idea of living card games, basically a collectible card game that you're going to buy packs for, but you know what's in those packs, and they release those regularly. Well, this concept, the, the unique game, is one in which everything you buy for it will be completely different, kind of, from anything else sold. And the way they do it is by selling you a pack of cards, and that pack of cards is completely unique. So having this pack of cards here, for example, it'll have a title, an image on the back, a collection of cards that make up the pack, and no one else is going to have exactly this one. Now the cards themselves, those are available in other packs. It's the combination of cards. So this is, and then you cannot break this up, by the way, right? So you have to play this as it is. So this is basically a collectible card game. It, it works really just like one if you step back and sort of look at a deck of cards as a single card, because you still don't know what deck you are getting. The deck is still, uh, you know, you have to open up the pack after you buy it and look at it, and now you know what you've got. But it does remove the idea of you know, making your own deck. It sort of, you know, removes from the equation this one step in going from getting into a game, buying up that game, and getting it to the table. There's none of this deck building part. That's not the part that they wanted to emphasize with this. And so it's a really clever idea taking something that's been done for, you know, decades now and kind of rewriting it, rewiring it, and putting it out again and it, it works. It's interesting. It's clever. It's uh, it's you you have the ability to really get invested in the uh, the decks of cards because they're gonna have, like I said, their own names, their own combinations of cards. That's 
just engaging, and I think this game has a really bright future myself. This is the original set, the base set, but there will be expansions, of course, in which they continue to do this. The technology aspect of it is probably what I find the most fascinating. The fact that they've got an algorithm, some sort of, uh, you know, machine that is going to create these combinations of decks, of cards, uh, make that a deck, give it a randomized illustration on the back, and then a, uh, you know, a randomized name as well to, to the deck itself. I've been enjoying the game a lot. It basically plays like a collectible card game. And uh, the idea of having to just open up that pack and play with it as is, is a fun... It's a fun limitation. It's really what it is. I wouldn't say it is supremely different from a collectible card game as far as the playing goes, but I have to respect the technology and just the the brilliant spark behind the game itself. So I do think that this is, you know, ultimately an innovative concept, one that probably couldn't have been done um, years ago, just because they wouldn't have been able to produce this volume of that many unique combinations of cards, decks of cards. And so I, I find it pretty cool. It's one that I, uh, like I said, I think it's gonna go far. I would certainly recommend it if you are someone who enjoys collectible card games, but you are, someone who maybe got burnt by the collectability of those games, the absolute randomness, because in this one, if you buy a deck of cards that is playable, you are good to go, you know, and you'll get, of course, in the base game, some decks uh, included in there. You get two that are not random, those are in every core set, but then included in the box, you do get two that are sealed, and those are random. So right off the bat, you've got four decks, two you should probably use to learn to, to play the game, and then two that could be anything. So there you go, that's Keyforge. Really enjoy this one. So for my quirky game, one that uh, feels kind of like a movie blockbuster, it's both revered by critics, but you know what, it's, it's just fun too. It, it's just kind of like a popcorn movie. Well, I think this is kind of like a popcorn game. And I've, uh, I've been having a blast with it myself. So there you go, check it out. Keyforge is my quirky game of the episode. Hey there, friends of the blend. This is Chris and Lindsay from Behind the Box, wishing you a very happy new year. And we thought we'd take this opportunity to reflect on our highlights from 2018. So, what better place to start than right here? Becoming Dice Tower contributors, that was a huge highlight of 2018. That was such a, a great moment, I feel like, for us when we were getting into the content creation stuff and it was just an incredible experience beginning this and it's been such a great way to sort of focus our creative efforts because we love having this idea of a theme of the week where we have to think about something very specific so that's been great around the same time we also started doing reviews with board game exposure and that was again another really great way of getting new games cycling through games sharing them amongst other reviewers and getting to know other people so yeah both of those definitely Great, mm -hmm. great opportunities. And we also really enjoyed going to conventions. Uh, it was really fun. We formed some awesome memories from those. Yeah. At Aircon, we enjoyed having mega games with uh, Rodney Smith of Number 9 and Karuba. That was fun. Mm -hmm. And then at UK Games Expo, we got the opportunity to play Crystal Hearts RPG with up to four players and semi-co-op. So that was that was great as well. That was awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a ton more really good memories <laughs> with those, but they're just two of the highlights. Another one more recent for us is over Christmas, we visited Lindsay's family in America, and every time we go, we always end up playing a game just a lot that becomes kind of the game of the holiday. So this year, we were like, right, let's pick a game that will be the game of the holiday, and we thought Scythe will probably go over really, really well, with especially your brother. And it did. <laughs> he loved it. And we really liked that game, but we played it at least once every day that yeah. we were there. And it was just incredible going through the different strategies and you just sort of see these different actions being taken and people trying different ideas. It was a really cool way of experiencing a game like that. And yeah, that easily makes the, the top of our list for this year for <laughs> highlights. We're also really grateful for the friends that we've made, both online and in person, hobbyists, and also other creators like ourselves, and you, the viewers. Like, we never would have been able to make these connections mm -hmm. if it weren't for board games. So on that note, we really want to wish you the best of 2019. We hope you have a great year and that you play lots of really fun games this year and make awesome new memories. And so from all of us to all of you, 
Happy New Year. Bye. Hi everyone, my name is Chris and this is the Teacher's Lounge. And if you're like me, you'll be on the Dice Tower Cruise 2019. So look for me around and I'll be happy to play some games with you. Today's topic is best of 2018. 2018's come to a close and we've seen some really great games. Featured here on the table are several of my favorite from the beginning of the year all the way through near the end. However, my favorite game very decisively this year is a game whose guts are about 10 years old. That's because my pick is Brass Birmingham. This game is built on the same core foundational rules that made the original Brass very popular, very um, uh, strategic, economic, thinky game. But I feel like the changes that Roxley made, the new developments, the new uh, mechanisms, new industries that you can build, are just wonderful. They really round out the game for me. I like the variability that they introduce onto the board each game. Small, simple changes that I think make it a much more approachable game while still being quite complex and heavy. So my recommendation for when you're gonna teach a game like this is to know there's gonna be lots of rules, lots of little exceptions, lots of important things you'll have to keep note of to make sure that you don't forget to teach. But most importantly, if you're going to be teaching a game that has rules exceptions, I would say, generally speaking, it's better to finish teaching and completely teach a concept the whole way through before worrying about explaining exceptions. Um, especially if they're going to lead to rabbit holes. If there's small exceptions, sure, you feel it out with your group and everything. But I think, for example, you can develop industry tiles so you can work from a level one cotton mill up to a level two or from two to three and there's most industries are going to function the same way and you have to spend certain resources and certain actions. But there are some industries that just have small little rules exceptions. Finish teaching the general concept all the way through and then say, but you'll notice this symbol means that there's an exception for this industry. Uh, if you are trying to teach partway through the concept and then you jump over here, if you get distracted, the learning is going to be distracted. It's going to be so much harder for people to retain what that general action is going to look like. Building has exceptions. Um, networking in this game, building up your canal and railways has exceptions. There's exceptions with almost every little action, so make sure to teach the general view first and then dive into where the rules are going to kind of change up a little bit. So that's my recommendation, because if, if taught well, brass is not terribly hard to learn, but very strategically deep and lots of choices to make. So try and make it an easy experience to get started first. So this is the Teacher's Lounge. My pick, 2018, Brass Birmingham. Very comfortably my favorite game that came out this year. My name is Chris from the Meeple Overboard podcast. I hope that you enjoyed, had a great end of your 2018, and that you have a great start to 2019. Thank you so much, and have a good one. And that's going to do it for us on this episode of Board Game Blender. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. A big thanks to all of my contributors and all of you as well for watching through 2018 and being a part of our little family. And a happy 2019 to everybody. I hope the year is starting off with a bang and it stays fantastic and filled with board gaming. So, again, I'm Z Garcia, and as always, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you.